was strictly uh, taboo uh, at the University of Chicago and many other places. Not quite that extreme, but I'm exaggerating. Uh, and it was a, the department was a stronghold of operant conditioning. And you know the story about operant conditioning and uh, the, the discrimination training of animals, to, for example, to emit a lever press when the light is on and not let, press the lever press, not make a lever press when the light is off. Uh, that was known as operant discrimination. In my interest in the work uh, on sleep and dreams being conducted at the University of Chicago, while I was attaching electrodes to the subject's head, it occurred to me that, indeed, there was something fascinating about the comings and goings of the alpha rhythm. Now, some of you don't know what the alpha rhythm is, but it's, it's a uh, 8 to 12 hertz dominant frequency that appears in the record in a rather intermittent random fashion, <clears throat> sometimes appearing for less than a second and other times running on continuously for as long as 20 seconds, but always present in most people at least a, a part of the time. It occurred to me that the, tr the discrimination training procedure might work quite well to get trained people to discern whether or not they were having an alpha rhythm. So after hooking up the subjects with occiput to ear electrodes, I told the subject, from time to time, you will hear a single ding of a bell. Sometimes I will ding it when the al an alpha rhythm is on, and sometimes I will ding it when it is off. You, of course, will not be able to see it because I'm in the recording room where I can see it and I'm giving the trials. And each time you make a guess whether it was on or off, I will tell you whether you were right or wrong. It didn't matter whether I said on or off or A or B. <clears throat> Anyhow, it was this dichotomous response which was to be made to try to, dis to discern the uh, presence or absence of the wave. I'm fond of saying that the first subject appears to have been sent either by God or, depending on one's point of view, the devil, uh, to uh, <laughs> encourage me along because I have never found a subject who was quite as good as this very first subject. After about four different sessions of about 45 minutes each, this subject suddenly began getting the answers correctly. He called the shots of whether he was having an alpha rhythm or not. And he was beginning, he, 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 within a period of two or three days, he went from something like 60% correct, with 50% correct, on up to the fourth day in which he achieved 100% correct. So here, this was something very fascinating an internal state that was being defined by the alpha rhythm which the person could discern whether it was occurring or not. What was even more interesting is that this, the subject having learned to make the discernment could actually learn to, con to, to control the presence or absence of it. So on my command, he could, for example, just say, uh, Let's say you, you keep it on now. So she, he would turn it on for page after page of algorithm. And when I said stop and hold it and don't make any, he would go for page after page without. Complete control learned from discrimination training only. And this highlights the fact that in any form of operant conditioning, it will be quite essential for the individual to discern something about what's happening inside him or her, the better to achieve control of it. I then uh, decided to directly train the control by using a tone that would come on whenever the alpha rhythm exceeded a, a fixed voltage, so that person heard something like beep, 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 beep and so on. And I told the subject, let's see if you could learn how to increase the duration of that beep. And sure enough, 
in a gen about four trials, uh, they were able to master the task. So this is the beginnings of the algorithm, and I must say it was a bit regretful that I succumbed to uh, the popularizing of this thing, because I was quite excited about it, and I didn't mind talking to various people in public about it, and the, the uh, magazine uh, Psychology Today sent a reporter to get an interview with me about this study, and that, that particular article, unfortunately, uh, was a little bit overdrawn in terms of the potential of this in learning about uh, individual self-consciousness, and it began to have a certain quality, especially when I said that some subjects report that rather the sensation of having alpha was present, uh, was pleasant, that somehow I had discovered the way to true uh, pleasure and joy, and I heard that, that UC Santa Cruz campus nearby, San Francisco, where I was working, uh, that I was rumored to become the new guru, uh, the electronic guru of the, the pathway to the higher life, et cetera, et cetera. And that was sure to kill the whole field in terms of its uh, uh, respectability among scientists. And even to this day, you will probably know that much of the scientific field, including especially perhaps the medical field and the neurophysiologic field, there's great skepticism that there's anything like to business about training uh, feedback control, let alone uh, any subjective effects from it. So I think I should stop here. It was a, a fascinating area, uh, and I learned that you have to be careful about popularizing something. Whenever you discover anything about the mind or discernment of brain activity, you are bound to run into controversy because that is something that everyone is both at the same time an expert on in terms of his own beliefs and is full of ideas and prejudices and whatever that, it have, that the, our culture has transmitted to, to them. And so uh, we, we can uh, be quite sure that any first person science will go forth with plenty of skepticism in ways that is good, in other ways, especially in terms of getting grants from the uh, government, it may be a little bit tougher. So that's the story as things stand now. And I must say, I was very pleased when in the, uh, around in the early 60s, I gave a talk at either the Eastern Psychological Association or the, uh, or the uh, uh, New York Academy of Science, I've forgotten which, where I was invited to give a talk. Uh, Barry Sturman was in the audience, and months later, he came to me after I had moved to California from the University of Chicago, and he said to me, you know, after I heard your talk, I thought it might be great to try it on this sensory motor rhythm that I've been experimenting with, pharmacologically and otherwise, and noticing this sensory motor rhythm from the motor, uh, the sensory motor strip. And doggone it, it worked, he said. And so that really was a day for me which said this technique is going to gain some utility because it now has practical consequences and not just as a scientific curiosity. And indeed, the field has now become synonymous with control of various physiologic functions in order to control various um, personal uh, and other uh, behavioral disorders. So uh, I think uh, Barry is to be congratulated for being the first to really uh, give a good, well done, rigorously controlled experimental series on the uh, sensory motor rhythm. And, and you know the rest of the story. It's, so that's sort of the history of the field.
night at our research foundation fundraiser, we had Joe Camilla, Barry Sturman, and Joel Lubar in the same room and sent chills down my spine. <laughs> foundation. Oh,